So last time we looked at the equations of motion derived using the Newtonian method and wrote it in a non-dimensional form. So if you remember, we used as the unit of length, the distance between the two primaries, M1 and M2, that's a natural unit of distance. And then the unit of time, we introduced this non-dimensional time tau, and one unit of tau is worth t over two pi of time, where t is the period of the primaries. So if we're talking about a spacecraft in the Sun-Earth system, the mu would be something like three times 10 to the negative six. Unit of length would be one AU, so about 150 million kilometers. And the unit of time would be t over two pi, where t is one year. So you can scale as appropriate for the system you're interested in. But it's always easier to try to non-dimensionalize as much as you can. So we, in some sense, did that. So now we've got these non-dimensional ODEs. So chi is the non-dimensional x direction in the inertial frame. Eta is the non-dimensional y. And then zeta, non-dimensional z. So these are the equations of motion. They're second order in the inertial frame. So this isn't the usual way that people view and solve or you know, generally just deal with three-body problem. They usually look in a rotating frame. So that's what we're going to do. We're starting from here, but we're going to go further. In some sense, we've got a vector differential equation here. And we'll introduce a rotating frame. But first, what do I mean by the vector that, that we already have. So we've got R written in the inertial frame and it's all non-dimensionalized now. Chi, eta, zeta. And the left-hand side up here looks like it's this vector. And then we took two derivatives, two derivatives with respect to the non-dimensional time. What we're gonna wanna do is get rid of these terms that have the cosine and sines. This time dependence is somewhat of a problem because that means every initial condition you give will also be connected to an, an initial time. So it's just, it's easier to analyze a set of differential equations if you can eliminate any explicit time dependence on the right-hand side. And here we have explicit time dependence. So we'd like to get rid of it. It might not be clear exactly how, but we're going to go into the frame that's co-orbiting with the two masses. And since they're moving in circular motion, it's a steady rotation. So it's a rotating frame. The M1, M2 line defines a new x-axis, and the out-of-plane direction provides the axis of rotation, and the angular rate, at least in these units, is just one. So this is the second derivative that the left-hand side is chi second derivative, eta second derivative, and zeta second derivative. There's this thing we could do if you've looked at the geometry of rotating frames, then hopefully this will be somewhat familiar to you. The N frame, we could write this as being NB times the same thing in a B frame. So what am I doing here? I'm saying there's an inertial frame, and now I'll draw it from above. N1, N2, N3 forms a right-handed coordinate system. And we've got another frame. These are just unit vectors. And I'm following the convention that I tend to use when I teach rigid body dynamics. As part of that, I also introduce the transport theorem and rotating frames. I don't think I'm going to use the transport theorem here. So we've got two frames. They've got a common origin. And the angle between the two, usually we would call that an angle theta. But now we'll say that angle is actually the non-dimensional time tau. So we've got two frames. And the way that you would relate the B frame, or what we would say is the rotating frame, with respect to the N frame, this is the direction cosine matrix. I'm using what's called explicit frame notation. So this is cosine tau, sine tau, negative sine tau cosine tau. We're just doing a right-handed rotation about the z-axis or the number three axis. And you usually write it in terms of uh, b with respect to n, the way I've done it here. 
I know up here I wrote NB. I'll get to that. There is a, a frame, and I can go ahead and put in, right? We've got M2 and then M1. And that forms the B1 axis. The two frames, if you wrote the B unit vectors as if they were a column vector, we're just sort of grouping them for mathematical convenience. This equals the BN matrix times N1, N2, N3. So the direction cosine matrix completely describes how the two frames are related. It also describes how two vectors are related. So if you had a vector in one frame and you wanted to compare it to a vector in another frame, so I could use any kind of vector. Maybe I'll write it orange over here. If I had any kind of vector, so I'm writing V just for vector. This doesn't mean it's the velocity, but any kind of vector, if you have the vector, you could write it in terms of B frame components or N frame components, and they're related. And the same way that the B unit vectors and the N unit vectors are related. The vector written in the B frame components is going to equal BN times the same vector written in the N frame components. If you haven't seen it written this way, this is the form that I'm adopting. And because we're talking about rotating matrices, this NB up here, this is the same as BN transpose. The inverse of a rotation is the transpose of that matrix. So I've got R written in the N frame is NB times R written in the B frame. So instead of maybe this, this vector here, if I was thinking of the position of point P, let's just call that vector R. And we could write that position vector in either the B frame components or N frame components. And that's all we're talking about here. So um, if instead of V, I put position vector, then that's what we got. So when you take the inverse of this, you get the equation that I already wrote up above, NB. And for convenience and to follow the notation that I use in my book, I'm going to call this matrix A sub tau. So A sub tau is just the transpose, and I won't use the bracket notation anymore for a matrix. So this is cosine tau, and then now the negative sign goes up here. Negative sine tau, sine tau, cosine tau. Now notice that A sub tau depends on time. What I'm going to want to do is take two derivatives of this equation. So if I take two time derivatives, and remember it's derivatives with respect to the time tau, what do I get? I'll get R, N. Let's just start with one derivative. So this is A tau times B, R. And I'm going to take the derivative of that. I guess I haven't said it yet. So let, let me say what I'm using for the frames here. In the rotating frame, let me put the unit vectors, B1, B2, and then B3. If we were to jump on that frame that's moving with the two masses, then M1 and M2 will be along the x-axis. And I may as well just call it the x-axis. And then this one, B2 is the y-axis. And B3, that's the z-axis. So I'm using lowercase x, y, and z to represent the position. Here's the particle P. And from the Berry center of the system, this is the position in the B-frame. So we're going to write that as x, y, and z. So if we take the derivative over here on this right-hand side, so looking back at this equation, well, we could use the product rule here. So we get a tau, the derivative of that with respect to time, times the position in the B-frame plus a tau times the time derivative of that. So that equation holds true. If you work out what it gives, a tau prime equals, you can work out that it equals negative a tau times a certain matrix that looks like zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, 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 zero. And this is times RB, may as well just put in what RB is, X, Y, Z, plus a tau, and then that derivative, which gives us X prime, Y prime, Z prime. We can combine these two 
we could pull out an overall matrix a tau we have x prime minus y y prime plus x and z prime we could repeat this take the derivative of that and just see what we get. So remember what this was. This was the the left hand side here. This is chi prime, eta prime, and zeta prime. Take the time derivative of that, and we'll get chi double prime, eta double prime, zeta double prime equals. And you could use the same sort of procedure as before. What you end up getting is a tau. And if we group all these terms, we get x double prime minus 2y prime minus x, y double prime plus 2x prime minus y, zeta double prime. So we've taken the left-hand side of our ODE for the motion of the particle, and now we've written it in terms of similar quantities, but in the rotating frame with an A tau out in front, this rotation matrix. We'll deal with that rotation matrix later. What I wanted to point out is what, what we just did is get the left-hand side up here of the ODEs. So now we want to get the right-hand side of the ODEs, but written in terms of this rotating frame. Can we do that? Yeah. So let's just look at the first term up here. We'll look at this first ODE, and then hopefully you'll be able to pick up the pattern. So we're going to try to write the right-hand side, but in terms of rotating frame components. So this, we might say, this is the left-hand side. Now work on the right-hand side. And let's start with the first thing. So we had, right, chi double dot equals, I should probably just repeat what I had up above. So hold on. What was it? Yeah. Okay, it's negative one minus mu chi plus mu cosine tau over distance to the first primary cubed. This was minus mu chi minus one minus mu cosine tau over rho two distance to the second primary cubed. Okay, so let's try to write this right-hand side using the rotating frame components. I'll just give it to you here. This is negative one minus mu. That, that doesn't change, but what is chi? Chi equals x cosine tau minus y sine tau. And then we put in plus mu cosine tau. So that's just the first term. About the second term, and this would be negative mu. And chi again is x cosine tau minus y sine tau. And let me write out this in terms of this will be plus mu cosine tau minus cosine tau all over rho two raised to the third. Now I'm using the same symbol for rho following what the book does. I might just write this as r. But that the distance doesn't change. And so the distance cube doesn't change. Distances don't change under rotation. So what do we mean by this? Maybe I'll put it down here somewhere. R1 squared equals, this is now the distance to the body, but in the rotating frame. So if this is M1, this is M2, I've got X and Y, then the distance to the particle. This is located at negative mu, zero, zero. M2 is located at one minus mu, zero, zero. So they're just along the x-axis. So what is R1 squared? This is going to be x minus minus mu, or x plus mu squared plus y squared plus z squared. It's just the distance, but as measured in terms of the rotating frame. R2 squared equals x minus one minus mu squared plus y squared plus z squared. We could write the distances. There's no sines and cosines out in front of that, but let's finish up what we have up here. I'm going to pull out cosine and negative sine. So I pull out everything that's got cosine tau times negative one minus mu x plus mu 
and then divided by R1 cubed. Then we have plus minus sine tau times negative one minus mu y, and then divided by R1 cubed. And then we'll have plus cosine tau. I'm now moving to the, the second term here. So we'll have minus mu x minus minus one minus mu over r2 cubed. Maybe you can see where this is going plus negative sine tau. This is time minus mu y over r2 cubed. Move that over. So just looking at this right-hand side, we could, we, hopefully you could see, we've got cosines and negative sines. If we do the same thing for eta double prime and zeta double prime, we'll actually see a pattern. And so this is what the pattern is. Chi double dot, eta double dot, zeta double dot equals, and there's an overall rotation matrix, a sub tau that I could bring out. And it multiplies minus one minus mu, x plus mu minus mu, x minus one minus mu, all over r2 cubed, this one over r1 cubed. Similarly, for the other two, minus one minus mu y over r1 cubed, minus mu y over r2 cubed. And then similarly for the z, it's minus one minus mu z r1 cubed minus mu z r2 cubed. And that's just a vector. But remember how we were able to write the left-hand side here? It also had an a tau. So if I just put in what we had for the left-hand side, this was a tau times x prime prime minus 2y prime minus x, y prime prime plus 2x prime minus y, and then z prime prime. So if you want, at this point, the rotation matrices cancel, or you just, you multiply by a tau transpose to both sides. And so what you get is you can get rid of all this. And that's our ODE written in the rotating frame. So there's it written in terms of three scalar ODEs. I mean, it takes some work to try to get things in the rotating frame. That was using the Newtonian approach. So this is the main set of ODEs that we're going to look at. This is the restricted, circular restricted three body problem, equations of motion in the rotating frame. And it's also already been non-dimensionalized. That's nice. Dr. Ross, you went from using the rows and then you went to the R's and then you went to the R's and the rows again. And then in the final equations there, you went back to the R's. R is just the same as rho. Now I'm using little r's as if they're the, the non-dimensional distances. My book uses that. It's sort of the standard convention. But this is going to be what I mean by the little r's. It's the non-dimensional distance from uh, the particle from each of the two primary masses. Another thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to not use this prime notation. I'm going to use over dots for time derivatives because it's just a lot easier. So from now on, I'm replacing the primes with over dots, but it means derivative with respect to the non-dimensional time. So this is the form of the equations. It's sort of a, a standard form that most people used. Some people have the situation where they have M1 on the right-hand side, but NASA uses this convention. So let's just stick with NASA's convention. It's also what my book uses, so it makes life easier for me. Hi, hey, Dr. Ross, I have a, a question. A little earlier, you mentioned um, transport theorem, but then you didn't have to use transport theorem in this derivation, presumably because this is in an inertial frame. Am, am I correct in stating that? 
I just did everything in the inertial frame and then used rotating matrices to put it into a rotating frame. So then it just becomes a lot of algebra. So you didn't have to use transport theorem, but you still took into account the fact that it, dynamics were not in the rotating frame. Is that correct? To do F equals MA, you have to write that in an inertial frame, but you could always view the resulting equations of motion in, in any frame you want, a translating or rotating, even with unsteady rotation. Here, it just so happened, a nice choice of frame is a rotating frame and it simplifies things. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The key thing is the right-hand side doesn't depend on time. So that means you can simulate things and it doesn't matter like what the initial phase is. All that matters is where the point P is with respect to the two primary masses and what the velocity is in that rotating frame. So this is, this is non-dimensionalized and the ODEs do not explicitly depend on time. In the language of differential equations, that means that these are autonomous ODEs. Because they're autonomous ODEs, there's a lot of techniques from the theory of dynamical systems that can be used. When you have time-dependent ODEs, and you know, what's an example of that? The way that a cloud moves under the wind. The wind is changing in time. In fact, in ways that are hard to predict. So it'd be like having a right-hand side for how the cloud moves that explicitly depends on time in a complicated way. We don't have that. So that's an advantage here. I have written this in second order form and often it's written in a first order form. In fact, to simulate or MATLAB, you always have to write things in first order form. If you haven't seen it done, the way that you put things in first order form, let's just do it here. You introduce variables. We introduce something that we'll call V sub X. And that's just the non-dimensional X velocity. We're defining this to be X dot. V sub Y, that's the non-dimensional Y velocity. V sub Z, that's the non-dimensional Z velocity. These three lines mean that I'm defining it that way. But then these also end up being the first three ODEs. So instead of having three second order ODEs, we're going to have six first order ODEs. In first order form, this becomes x dot equals vx, y dot equals v sub y, z dot equals vz. Those are the first three. The next three are vx dot. So vx dot is actually x double dot. So I'm going to rewrite the first equation up there. And what will happen? We'll get two y dot, instead of y dot, I write this as vy plus x, and then all that other stuff. One minus mu x plus mu over r1 cubed minus mu x minus one minus mu r2 cubed. Moving on to the next one, vy dot, this will equal negative two, it's negative two x dot, but instead of x dot, I write v x and then this is plus y and then the terms that come from gravity one minus mu y for r1 cubed minus mu y r2 cubed z is always the easiest one because the two bodies are in the xy plane there's something about the xy plane that's special and in fact usually i'll be talking about the planar circular restricted three-body problem where you just set z equal to zero and then everything happens in that xy plane. That's where most of the interesting dynamics happens anyway. So this will just be, there's no weird vx and vy terms on the right-hand side here. It's just the gravity stuff. Negative one minus mu z r1 cubed minus mu z r2 cubed. So that's writing it in first order form. You would give this an, an initial condition like x at time zero, y at time zero, z at time zero, vx at time zero, the y at time zero, and the z at time zero. And then you would numerically integrate, meaning numerically solve, use something like ODE 45. I mean, that's one of the things about the three-body problem is it does not admit general closed form solution. So that famously discouraged Newton. There's no analytical solution like there was for the two-body problem. So he left it for later mechanicians to try to work some things out. So I, this is putting it in first order form after deriving using the Newtonian approach. I would like to show you the Lagrangian approach. 
And I think the Hamiltonian approach, partly just to show their power, the Lagrangian approach is really cool and it gets the equation of motion so quickly, your head will spin. So we spent about a lecture and a half talking about the Newtonian approach, but there's a Lagrangian approach. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe or just wait and watch the next video in the series.